Okay, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to y'all's second breakout session for Sunday. Um, the title of this session is going to be Civil Liberties in a Free Society with Jacob Hornberger. Um, <clears throat> Jacob Horn Hornberger is founder and president of the Future of uh, Freedom Foundation. <clears throat> he was born and raised in Laredo, Texas, and received a BA in economics from Virginia Military Institute and his law degree from the University of Texas. He was a trial attorney for 12 years in Texas, <clears throat> and he also was an adjunct professor at the University of Dallas, where he taught law and economics. In 1987, Mr. Hornberger left the practice of law to become a director of programs at the Foundation of Economic Education. <clears throat> He's advanced freedom and free markets on talk radio stations all across the country, as well as on Fox News' Neil Cavuto, uh, Greta Van Susteren's show, and he has also appeared regularly on uh, Judge Andrew Napolitano's show, Freedom Works, or Freedom Watch, I apologize. Uh, uh, please join me in welcoming Jacob Hornberger. Thank you. Uh, you know, when you, when you talk about civil liberties, especially at a conference like this, um, a, a natural question arises, and that is, um, why should we spend time on it? Uh, I mean, it sort of feels like an esoteric subject, sort of like a sidelight, um, I mean, what really matters, right, uh, for us libertarians is, is economics. I mean, that's why we, mostly why we come to conferences like this. This is how most of us got into uh, the liberty movement. We see the out-of-control federal spending and, and the, the out-of-control debt and the enormous tax burden that's coming, especially for your generation with the ever-increasing Social Security, uh, where they're taking money out of your pockets to give it to the seniors and Medicare and Medicaid, and we're heading toward uh, the situation in Greece, and we have, you know, minimum wage laws that lock the poor out of, of jobs, and the whole failure of the welfare state managed economy paradigm. I mean, that's, that's really what, what we're, we come to conferences like this for, right? We, we, we read Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman and Ayn Rand, and I mean, this is how I got into the movement when it was the whole economic paradigm of economic liberty. And so you, you look at that and you say, well, you know, why should I go to lectures on civil liberties and foreign policy and so forth? That's not really what I'm here for. It's not what I, why I'm in this movement for. It's not what's important. Well, the answer to all these questions is the reason we do this and the reason we at the Future of Freedom Foundation devote so much of our efforts and our energies to civil liberties it's very simple. When you compare economic liberty to civil liberty, there's no comparison. That is, economic liberty is subordinated in importance to civil liberty. There's nothing more important than civil liberty. That is, if you're interested in a free society, then you cannot avoid the concept of civil liberty. If you're interested only in economic liberty, no problem. But if you're interested in a free society and living in a free society and achieving a free society, which I think most of us, for most of us, that's our goal, then you can't help confront what's going on in terms of civil liberties and foreign policy. I mean, this is why we, we partnered with the Young Americans for Liberty in our two college civil liberties tours. I mean, we, we love yeah, just like we love Students for Liberty, it, 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 you've got a great organization in Yale. And we, so we had these two college civil liberties tours where we had Bruce Fine, Glenn Greenwald, who's probably the most, well, who is the most competent, eloquent proponent in, among liberals of civil liberties, and, and myself, and then Jack Hunter, who served as an advisor for the Ron Paul campaign. We went on a college tour all across the country. Uh, developing the idea and sharing with college students the importance of civil liberties. Let me give you a real life example of what I'm talking about. 9-11. 9-11-1973. Because there was another 9-11 event that was a watershed event, not only in the life of the Chilean citizens, but also in the American people. Because what happened in Chile on 9 11, 1973, is an absolute, unbelievable event, and one that still shapes the lives of the American people to this day. In 1970, a socialist had been elected president of Chile. 
a real socialist. I mean, this guy, he embodied everything that Franklin Roosevelt believed in. He believed in a managed economy. He believed in economic interventionism. He believed in, 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 in state management of, of industries, state interference in the economy, price controls, minimum wage laws, paper money. He believed in nationalizing businesses and industries. You know, it's sort of like how uh, Roosevelt nationalized everybody's gold. Now, he, he took it to a much further level than Roosevelt did because... He was more than a, a socialist or a liberal or progressive, you know, whatever you call a person that believes in all this interventionism. He was a dyed-in-the-wool Marxist. And he, he made no bones about it. That he, was, he believed in Marxism. He believed in the socialist aspects of Marxism. He, he aligned himself with the Communist Party. But there was this vibrancy in Chile, this democratic vibrancy, where you had people battling intellectually. And, and so it was that in this election in 70. Allende, who had run for president three or four times, he was a physician, he gets, he gets elected through a plurality of the votes. So here you have this democratically elected socialist, Marxist, communist. Well, not surprisingly, when he starts implementing all his policies, the same, what, same thing that happened with Roosevelt, the whole economy goes into chaos, you know, like it did during the New Deal era. And it same thing happened here in, in Chile. I mean, everything just starts going... Uh, just to, to pieces. You know, economy plunges, the, 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 the standard of living's plunging, there's chaos. Oh, and it was made worse by the fact that the CIA was down there intentionally making it worse because President Nixon had said, we can't have a socialist. We can't allow people to make mistakes like this in democracies. The voters make mistakes. And to elect a socialist is a threat to the national security of the United States even though there was no evidence that, that he had any interest in sending the Chilean army marching up South America and into Central America and then crossing over at Laredo or El Paso and, and invading the United States. No evidence of that at all. And so they, they made what, they, what Nixon called make the economy scream. And so they were bribing people to go on strike with CIA, U.S. taxpayer money, things like that. The whole thing collapses, and it was all with the intent to have a military coup, where a military dictatorship takes power. And that's what happened on 9-11, 1973, with the full support of the U.S. military and the CIA, what we call the U.S. national security state, the, the apparatus that came into existence after World War II, supposedly to fight the Cold War, but never disappeared at the end of the Cold War. But here it was in full action in Chile fully supporting this, full, this military dictatorship. So they take control to establish order and stability. And guess what they do? They got a military general, General Pinochet, takes, takes control. And he embraces the philosophy of Milton Friedman. All the free enterprise ideas that, that, you know, that we would stand for. Deregulation, you know, limiting the supply of money, you know, uh, so there's, there's very little inflation low taxes. He even hires, he puts in his cabinet people that were studying, had studied under Friedman, Chileans who had studied under Friedman at the University of Chicago. Friedman even goes down to Chile, says, hey, this is what you need to do here. And so they were following the principles of economic liberty, not purely, but in large extent, yes. So here you have a society where you have, quote, economic liberty, or at least movements in that direction. So what would we say, those of us that attend conferences like this? Wow, this is great. This is freedom, right? This is what we want. OK, the guy's not democratically elected. He won't stand for elections. But hey, who cares, you know, whether he's democratically elected or not? Democracy led to a socialist. Here's a guy that is free enterprise. Freedom's here. Well, except for one thing. Pinochet felt that he was at war. And so did the US government. So did the Pentagon, so did the CIA. He was at war against communism. And so he proceeds to round up 40,000 people, most of whom had not committed any acts of violence. They simply had had a belief in their minds of believing in socialism or progressivism or liberalism in the sense of how we use the word today. Many of them had served in the Allende regime. Some of them were intellectual communists, Marxists. But he had initiated no violence. And he rounds them up. 
no trials, no arrest warrants. He doesn't need that. He's at war. He's a commander-in-chief, just like Obama in the war on terrorism. He doesn't need warrants. He doesn't need jury trials. He knows that they're, they're guilty. And then, out of those 40,000, he takes 3,000 through his military, through his CIA, and he proceeds to torture them and rape them in order to get them to divulge information as to their, who their socialist friends are and their communist friends are. And then they go in, once they, they buckle on to, to brutal, brutal torture, they go out and round up those people. And then there's kidnappings on the streets, just like the CIA does in the war on terrorism. That they go in there and they just, they, they see a socialist and they grab him you know, six or seven gendarmes out of, a, out of a car, and everybody else just walks real quietly, doesn't say anything. They pick up the guy or the girl, they take him to a torture chamber, and they tell him, you have now disappeared. You are now a number. You will never be part of society again. And then they proceed to torture them, rape them, and then drop them over in the ocean after drugging them, killing them, executing them. And they did this to 3,000 people. Now, those that say, well, economic liberty is what matters might say, well, this is a free society. And U.S. officials said it was a free society. The Pentagon was proud of this. The CIA was proud of this. Because you got free enterprise philosophy over here, and you've got the incarceration and the killing and the torture of communists. And here was, you know, we were in the Cold War. This was 73. Vietnam was still going on. They loved this. They thought, man, this is ideal. You're killing communists here in Chile, Chile, and nobody's losing their life. I mean, the military wasn't, you know, there was a few casualties, but there was gun control in Chile. Citizens didn't have guns to resist this. And this went on for some 20 years or so. And so needless to say, there was no, you know, any more democratic vibrancy, intellectual discussions, fights, and stuff like that that had been going on before the coup. Let, let me put it like this. Let, 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 let me devise a hypothetical here. Suppose those of us in this room are a nation. That we, we've all moved to an island in the Caribbean and, and we're going to establish a, a nation on this island. And we're all the citizens. And, and you guys say, well, you know, Jacob, you're older and wiser. We're going to elect you president. And I say, okay, great. So you, you elect me president of, of our nation here, okay? And, okay, now we're going to sit down and we're going to negotiate rights and powers. We're going to drop a constitution. It's going to delineate what your rights are that I can't interfere with and, and we're, what my powers are. And we're going we're to cut a deal. And so I asked you all, I said, okay, what, uh, what rights do you all want? Do you, do you want me to respect? And you say... We want our God-given natural rights. Okay, that's what Jefferson talked about in the Declaration. We, we don't want you to interfere with these rights. Don't infringe on them. I said, okay, what are you talking about? Okay, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, um, right to peaceably assemble, uh, right to speak out, um, right to criticize you, Jacob, right to criticize the government, um, economic liberty, no income tax, uh, no regulations, no permits, no licensure, uh, no welfare state. We keep everything we earn. We decide what to do with it. No Social Security, no Medicare, uh, no trade restrictions. We can trade with anybody we want. Oh, and no gun control. We, we want guns to protect ourselves against tyranny, to shoot deer, whatever. Protect ourselves against burglars. I say, done. No problem. Yours. I promise I will never interfere with these rights. And you say, okay, Jacob, now what powers do you want? And I say, I just want one power. That's all. I want the power to keep you safe through my army. I want a big army. And I want a CIA. And I want an FBI. And I want the power to keep you safe by being able to send my people out to arrest terrorists and communists and anybody else that would do you harm. That's what I want. You say, wow, Jacob, that's perfect. That's no problem at all. You respect our rights. You keep us safe. Done. 
You've just now traded away everything. Your rights mean nothing. Because let me tell you what's going to happen. I go over to this gentleman here, and I order my army to pick him up and cart him away to a concentration camp or a military dungeon. And you say to me, hey, wait a minute, Jacob. This guy's a friend of ours. What are you doing that to him for? And I say, keep your mouth shut. We cut a deal. My job's to keep you safe. And I don't have to answer anything to you as to how I'm keeping you safe. In fact, I don't even have to acknowledge that I've done anything to him. Any more than President Obama is acknowledging when he does this thing to, to people. I have determined that he's a danger, that he's a communist, that he's a terrorist. I choose this. I make the determination. And I don't even have to acknowledge it. But I make the determination, not you. I don't need to go to court. I don't need to charge him with an indictment. We're at war here. And I'm a commander in chief. He's gone. Boom. I go after you now. And my people pick you up. And everybody says, well, Jacob, how do we know you're not picking him up because he's been criticizing you? Don't second guess me. It's none of your business. It's my job to keep you safe. I decide who the terrorist is. Well, Jacob, don't you have to go to court and get a warrant? No, we're at war. And that's the powers that were being exercised by Pinochet with the full support of the Pentagon and the CIA. Those are the powers that are now being exercised and wielded by President Obama. Now, is he rounding up 40,000 people? No. Are they torturing and raping 3,000 people? No. But what we do know is that they have supported regimes that do these things. They helped install them like they did in Chile. They supported them like the military dictatorship in Egypt. Or they've been partnering with the Egyptian regime when Mubarak was in power for decades with U.S. taxpayer money and even entering into a torture partnership with them where they kidnapped a guy off the streets of, uh, of, of Milan, Italy and they transported him forcibly after drugging him over to the torturers in Egypt. Just like Pinochet's people were doing. And they don't have to answer to anybody. Because we're at war, you see. We're at war against the terrorists. Now, they say to us, well, this is national defense, right? We have a Department of Defense, right? I mean, a Department of Defense. They're protecting our rights and freedoms. They're keeping us safe, right? I mean, it's what, what, what Pinochet was doing. He was keeping it safe. He had an assassination program that went beyond his borders, just like ours does. In fact, they assassinated a man named Orlando Letelier right here, the guy who, who orchestrated the bombing that killed Letelier, as well as, a, I think it was a 21-year-old girl named Ronnie Moffat, an American, that was in the car. They, they justified that, that... He was a socialist. He was a communist. He had served in the Allende regime. He was here lobbying Congress to cut off aid to the Pinochet regime. He's a threat. You can't second guess Pinochet. He's commander in chief. So they assassinated Letelier right here on the streets of Washington, D.C. Oh, and by the way, the guy who led the assassination team, they say, was former CIA. But at the very minimum, he used to be CIA. He was now working for the Chilean Pinochet dictatorship. They say all this is for defense to keep us safe. Now, this is really interesting now, because and, and now, here arises the question is why do they hate us? You know, they say, oh, well, we're keeping you safe because Al Qaeda's coming to get you. You know, Al Qaeda's going to come and they're going to invade America. They're going to take over the public schools. They're going to start teaching our children. They're going to take over the IRS and they're going to run the interstate highway system. And, oh, really? Where are the transport ships? The military transport ships. I mean, to successfully invade and occupy this country, especially since we don't have gun control and there's so many well-armed Americans, do you realize how many millions of invaders you'd have? I mean, millions and millions of troops to successfully invade and occupy and cross the ocean. I mean, Hitler couldn't even cross the, the English Channel to successfully invade Great Britain. But somehow or another, Al-Qaeda is going to mass hundreds of thousands of, of transport ships, transport airplanes, supply lines to come and invade the United States? It's ridiculous. I mean, sure, they may come over and blow up a building here or there, but it's a far cry from invading and occupying the entire country and conquering America. 
And then why? Why do they want to come over here and, and attack on our 9-11? Well, ask them. You know, when a guy's trying to kill you, isn't it a smart thing to do to say, why are you trying to kill me? I mean, it seems to me you'd want to know. I mean, maybe he's got the wrong guy, right? Hey, I'm because I want to kill you. You're Joe Doe. And I'm, no, I'm not. I'm Steve Doe. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, so you ask them, the people that are doing these things, why, are you, why do you hate us? And they all say it's all unanimous because of what your government is doing in our part of the world. We don't want you in our part of the world. Get out. Go home. Take your troops home. Take your CIA home. Go home. We don't want your regime change operations. You know, when you come into Iran and you oust our democratically elected prime minister, like you later ousted the democratically elected prime uh, president of Chile or the, the democratically elected president of Guatemala in 1954, get out of here. We didn't like it that you installed this dictator of the Shah of Iran and taught his torture team how to torture. We don't like you intervening in our affairs. We don't like you bribing people to run for office in our countries. We don't like you supporting our brutal dictatorships to suppress us, like in Egypt, in Jordan, in Saudi Arabia. We don't like your sanctions that killed hundreds of thousands of Iraqi children. We don't like your cavalier attitude toward life, the sanctity of life of Muslims and people in the Middle East. Get out. Go home. We don't want you here. But you see, the U.S. national security state says, are you kidding? This is our freedom. We have the freedom to do these things. We're Americans. We have the freedom to invade your countries. We have the freedom to engage in regime change, to impose these sanctions. We have the freedom to kill people to bring democracy to your lands. This is part of our heritage of freedom. So when they say, we're defending your rights and freedoms, this is what they mean by this. The will to dominate through the national security state. They really are genuine when they say, oh, we're protecting your freedoms. When you see the Super Bowl and the sportscasters are saying, let's thank the troops for defending our rights and freedoms. That's what they're referring to, is the right of the government to, to interfere in the affairs of the Middle East and the rest of the world. Chile, Guatemala, Latin America. That's what they mean by defending our rights and freedoms. That's church ministers. Church ministers who say, you know, every Sunday, want to pray for the rights of the unborn. And in the very next prayer, let us pray for the troops who are defending our rights and freedoms. See, because in their mind, the right of the U.S. government to do these things to stay there in the Middle East and elsewhere, that's part of our rights and freedoms. Is it? Is it you know, they call it a Department of Defense, you know, that this is defending our country, defending our country, defending our rights and freedoms. Oh? Well, let's, let's take a look at another country. To, if we really want, want to, to see what national defense really is, let's look at Switzerland. Okay. Switzerland has no uh, overseas bases. Our empire's got 1,000 in, in, in uh, I forget, 130 countries. I mean, can you imagine if foreign bases were here in the United States, how people would resent it? Okay, uh, Switzerland has no troops overseas. They don't support military, I mean, military dictatorships and other dictatorships. They don't give foreign aid to dictatorships like the U.S. government does. They don't impose sanctions and embargoes on other countries. They don't get involved in the elections of other countries. They don't get involved with politicking and, and, and trying to manipulate elections in foreign countries. They don't do any of that. You know what Switzerland does? Their entire military strategy is self-defense. That's it. The defense of their country. Now, compare that to everything the U.S. national security state does overseas that they call freedom in defending national defense and the Department of Defense. Switzerland does none of those things. The government just minds its own business. But everything's oriented to the defense of the country. They have no gun control. Everybody's armed to the teeth. They have assault rifles in every house. Now, the one downside of their system is conscription. They've got a draft. They draft everybody from 20 to 30 or something like that, which they don't need anyway, because everybody in the country is ready and willing to fight for the defense of their country and their homeland and their families. So everybody's well-trained. Shooting is a national pastime. Everybody's an expert shot. 
There's a famous story where some German, and, it's, and it, this heritage goes back centuries, where some German prince or king or something comes to Switzerland and says, how many men you have under arms? And they don't have a big standing army. They have a great big base of, of citizen soldiers that are ready, and they know where they're supposed to go in case of an invasion. They, they've got their assault rifles in their homes. They're all expert shots. And they have a very small base of, of active duty military. So this, this uh, German prince or king or something is talking to a, his Swiss counterpart, and, he's, and he says, how many men do you have under arms? And, and the Swiss said, we could have 250,000 men overnight. And the uh, German says, I may get the numbers wrong, but the German says, what would you do if my half a million man army invaded Switzerland tomorrow? And the Swiss commander says, it would be no problem. My 250,000 man force would take their positions, fire two shots, and return home. And that's their confidence. And that's their heritage. A small active army, no big military industrial complex, no CIA, and it's big base of well-armed, well-trained citizen soldiers with no, with a no surrender policy. When Germany had Switzerland surrounded in World War II, Hitler hated Switzerland because he wanted them to, to succumb to absorption by the Nazi empire like, like Austria had done. There's a big part of Switzerland that's German speaking and they refused to do that because of their heritage of independence and freedom. And, uh, and the Swiss told Germany, uh, told Hitler, we have a no surrender policy. There will never be surrender by the Swiss people. And the junior officers would get together and they would, they would decide, they, they would decide that if a senior commanding officer intimated surrender in a battle, they would remove him, the junior officers would remove him, execute him on the spot and replace him with a guy that would not even think of surrender. And, and everybody was ready to fight. The older people, the ones 40s, 50s, and 60s, they had armbands where they would be official soldiers and they would join the local units so that they would not be enemy combatants not wearing a uniform. Everybody was prepared to fight. And Hitler could not invade because of that reason. His, his advisors told him, we will lose. We might beat them, we don't know. But they will fight to the death and they will defend their homeland. They were ready to blow up every bridge, every ship. They were ready to, to go back into the Alps and then engage in a guerrilla campaign. And Hitler's advisor said, we can't afford to fight this country. And so while the other neutral countries, Belgium and so forth, they could overrun those very quickly, not Switzerland, because the people were so well armed with no gun control and well trained. That is national defense. And why do I bring up Switzerland? Well, guess who served as a model for America, for America's founding fathers when they were establishing our country. You got it, Switzerland. They pointed to Switzerland, you know, an association of cantons, an association of colonies, of states, coming together in a grand confederation in one nation, limited national government, and no big military establishment. That was why Americas were so different. Americans were so different. Throughout the 1800s, no big standing army, a nation of citizen soldiers ready to fight if necessary, if their country's ever invaded, no CIA, no gun control. And so they didn't have the ability, they didn't to, to even go abroad in, in what John Quincy Adams called in search of monsters to destroy. And that was the attitude. They said, look, we know there's bad things that happen overseas. There's genocides, there's tyranny, there's famines. But this government is not going to go abroad to fix those problems. Because we, if we do that, we will turn to the dark side. The American people will turn to the dark side. It will affect us as a people if we do that. Americans individually will be free to go overseas and fight in foreign wars and, and help people suffering tyranny and oppression, fine. Go over there and do that. A lot of Americans did that during World War II. They joined the Royal Air Force or Spanish Civil War. They won't fought over there. Great. Send money over there, but not the government. It was a remarkable way of life. Oh, oh by the way, Americans also, it's impossible to overstate how different America was. No Social Security, no Medicare, no Medicaid, no income tax, no Federal Reserve, no paper money, gold and silver coins were the official money, and no gun control, no immigration controls. 
Because the attitude was, look, we're not going to come and send our armies, our bombs, our missiles, or whatever, because we don't have them to come and save you. But if you get out, if you escape tyranny, oppression, there is an, a nation you can come to that will not return you. And that's the United States of America. So yeah, there's some cursory inspection at Ellis Island for tuberculosis. That's it. Once you're in, you're in. That was the way they helped people. And then everything changed. And so now we live in a country where there is, on the economic side, Social Security, the welfare state, Medicare, Medicaid, farm subsidies, aid to dictatorships, the whole confiscatory idea of take your money in order to give it to other people. Income tax, Federal Reserve, paper money, irredeemable. But over here on this side, it's much darker. Because now you've got this empire, vast military industrial complex, the great big Pentagon that came into existence in World War II and never went out of existence because they used the threat of the Soviet Union, their partner and ally in World War II. They converted them into an official enemy to justify the national security state, the CIA. An apparatus that President Eisenhower, a former military general, said is a grave threat to our democratic processes. That John Kennedy said he was going to tear the CIA into a thousand pieces when he finally saw what this, this thing was all about. Who didn't trust the military establishment and was trying to do everything he could to end the Cold War in personal negotiations with Nikita Khrushchev at the time he was assassinated. And then 30 days after that assassination, former President Truman says that the CIA is a sinister force in American life in an op-ed in the Washington Post, which you can find online. And ever since then, no one has dared to challenge this apparatus. And yet this apparatus is what has taken us to the dark side. This is the apparatus that, that now overwhelms or everything's oriented toward the military, the contractors, the economy. But most important, this notion of keeping us safe with the power to assassinate us, the power to execute us, the power to torture us, and they've done it. They did it to an American named Jose Padilla, and that was the precedent. They said Padilla is an enemy combatant in the war on terrorism, just like Pinochet was doing in the war on communism. And they took him and put him in a military dungeon. He's an American citizen, and they tortured him. And the courts upheld it. And then, in the total fraud of the courts, they turn around and they, they make him a criminal defendant because we all know that terrorism is a crime. It's in the U.S. Code. They prosecute terrorists in federal court every day. And so they, this newfangled system where they can flip back and forth and say, you're an enemy combatant or you're a criminal defendant, total perversion of the rule of law. Or they're assassinating people, Americans, not just foreigners, assassinating people. Uh, 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 Anwar al-Awlaki, why? Why they assassinate him? They won't tell us. Why they assassinated a 16-year-old boy? Imagine, assassinating teenagers, American teenagers, and they don't have to answer to it. That's the dark side. That trumps the economic liberty. Because when they have the power to take you out or to take your girlfriend to a torture chamber, a rape chamber, and have soldiers take turns with them like they did at Abu Ghraib with the sex abuse and so forth, and you ha can't do anything about it, that's when you start to think, oh, heck, what happened here? I was so consumed with economic liberty that I failed to see this huge, ominous cloud hanging over America. Where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us right here where you have to help lead us out of this morass. I mean, you're at this conference because you have broken through. Everybody at this conference has broken through. You, you've seen the, 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 the charade and the falsity and the lies of the welfare state. You know this is not freedom. You know the welfare state is not freedom. Like we were all taught, you grew up in a free enterprise society. It's not a free enterprise society. The 19th century was a free enterprise society when, in the absence of all this stuff. But now you've broken through on the wielding of these ominous dictatorial powers, the power to assassinate, the power to torture, the power to execute, no due process of law, no criminal indictment. We just pick you up, we snuff you out, we snuff you out, and there's nothing the rest of you can do about it because they're keeping us safe. It is incumbent on you to lead us out of this morass. And that, that's what we have to do. We have to lead America out of this morass. And can we do it? Of course we can do it. If the status could move a, America into this direction, just really through the power of ideas, 
We can lead us out. But that's our job. That's our job. There's so many people dependent on the, on the dole. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, farm subsidies, FDIC. So many people on the dole that they, they don't want to challenge the state at a fundamental level. You're not there yet. You're not on the dole yet. You, you have a sense of independence. You have the ability to lead. And all great movements have been led by an infinitesimally small minority of people. And that's just through the power of ideas. And that's what we've got to do. Well, you've got to join up with those of us in our generations that are fighting to restore a free society to our land. We need your help to get this country back on the right track. And I say that that right track has to involve, at a minimum, the dismantling of this entire military structure, this notion that it's necessary for defense, that's protecting us from it. There's not one country on earth that's got the military capability or even the money, everybody's broker than our government is, to invade the United States, to cross the oceans with a military army. They should have dismantled this thing at the end of the Cold War because what they did in the Middle East after the Cold War is what's given us this war on terrorism and all the dark side. And dismantle this, this CIA, this, all this interventionism, and restore a free society, a limited government republic to our land. Thank you very much. Okay, questions, comments? Yeah. Oh, wait, take the microphone so that it feeds into it. It won't be broadcasting in the room, but it'll be broadcasting for the tape. Um, I almost fully agree with everything you said. Um, my question would be, how do you deal with the consequences that already exist? The hatred towards America that already is in place now. Do you think that would fade away if we get our troops home? Do you think that would, how would you uh, address that? Okay. Uh, great question. I mean, it's impossible to know how people are going to react over a long term when they've lost their wives or their children to U.S. bombs or sanctions or whatever. The rage may be so deep that they say nothing's going to stop us from retaliating. Um, but at least that's limited in scope. And it dissipates over time. Uh, it, it's limited to the people there the, so, so the, the, that it happened to. So the worst thing you can do is amplify it and make it bigger. And, and, and that's what this foreign policy has done, like your invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, is that I call it the greatest terrorist-producing machine in history. Because the more people they kill, I mean, I would say 99% of the people in Afghanistan they've killed didn't have anything to do with 9-11. And, and the more people they kill, the more anger and rage of the survivors, the cousins, the families, and so forth. But look at Vietnam. I mean, the U.S. invades Vietnam, kills one million, two million people. Uh, take a look at Nick Terse's new book, T-U-R-S-E, called Killing the Enemy. Nurse, uh, Terse documents and details a secret classified documents showing that there was an intentional targeting of civilians by the U.S. military that... that that My Lai was not an aberration, it was just the tip of the iceberg. They napalmed entire villages, they raped girls. I mean, it, it, it's just horrendous what, and bombing North Vietnam in a civil war and, and all telling us, well, if we don't do this, the communists will come to America and conquer America. It was all a big lie. But how many Vietnamese have retaliated? There, there's not one instance of any Vietnamese family coming over here and doing terrorist strikes and stuff. I mean, I think most people just want to return to a life of normalcy where they're raising their family and trying to, you know, improve their economic well-being and, and so forth. Um, stop the killing, stop the interventionism, and then see what happens. Anybody else? Did you want to follow up? Yes. Um, I was actually, I'm from Iraq, and I, lived, I was in Baghdad when the invasion happened, um, and I witnessed what you're saying uh, firsthand, and... Um, I think a distinction could be there's you could make an argument that the difference between Afghan uh, the between the Middle East in general and Vietnam is the religious aspect, um, and I wonder if you think that has any role if Islam or militant Islam has any role in this because it's not against America alone it's it was against Soviet Union and. China, 
and many parts of the world, and, and it has a lot of historical context. I realize it's also because of their interventionist policies that could make, um, uh, that could be it, but w do you think the religion aspect has anything to do with it? Thank you. No. Uh, I think it's perceived that way, especially by people over there, by Muslims, because it looks like a crusade, the, the Western crusaders, and Bush even referred to it as a crusade. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's more in the sense of the will to dominate, whether these people are Muslims or not, and the will to resist, whether they're Muslims or not. I mean, some people don't resist when, when you've got foreign incursions like this. Uh, the U.S. has in, uh, in, uh, interfered in Latin America for decades. I mean, they, you know, they oust the democratically elected leader of Guatemala. They install a, brutal, a series of brutal dictatorships and stuff. Well, you know, you, if, if uh, all of a sudden those people started to retaliate, you know, somebody could say, well, you know, it's the Catholics, man. Uh, they're retaliating. They've invaded us because we're Catholics and stuff. I think it's really a matter of just leave us alone. And, and, and the national security state targets different countries. Um, and in the Middle East, it happens that there's a lot of Muslims there. And, but I think while it's perceived, and I think the, the US treats Muslims, because obviously if you target a country that's 99% Muslims and there's, there's a certain percentage of retaliating, obviously it looks like it's a religious conflict. Oh, it's Muslims attacking on 9-11. Well, I think it's just because you happen to be targeting an area that's predominantly Muslims. but. It's, it's a will to dominate. I don't think it has anything to do with, well, Christians over there are trying to conquer Muslims, although they may perceive it that way. Uh, but I think it's just a question of leave us alone. Just get out of our part of the world, uh, whether you're Christian, Jews, or whatever. Leave us alone. Yeah, anybody else? Um. I was wondering, what would you say to the argument that uh, we have like a humanitarian obligation to intervene when a country's leader, a country's leader starts slaughtering its people, in the case of like Iraq and Saddam Hussein or any other dictator? I think it's absolutely horrendous. Um, I think the founding fathers had it right. That you don't send your government over there to, to stop that sort of thing. Um, that you instead open up your borders. If you really care about these people, think about it. If you really care about them, then what's wrong with having them come to the United States? I mean, we've all been growing up under this sense of immigration controls and you know, security walls and the Berlin Wall down on the southern border. And, and America was so different in the 19th century. It was, we don't have these barriers that if you really care about people, you, then you say, come over here. Escape your tyranny and come over here. But it's even worse than that because a, ma a mathematical calculation has to be made here. Like they, they use this justification with Iraq because everybody agrees that Iraq never attacked the United States. Okay, there's this tangential relationship with Afghanistan, Al Qaeda was there, and so forth. And, and we'll set that aside and whether even that's justified. But Iraq, nobody questions this was not a country that attacked the United States. There's no question that U.S. is the aggressor. And, 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 the US, and Iraq's the defending nation. Now, they had a bunch of justifications, WMDs, UN resolutions, mushroom clouds over American cities, blah, blah, blah. None of that materialized, so they finally settled on this, oh, well, we're, we're saving the Iraqi people from tyranny, that Saddam is killing the people. Well, the people that Saddam was killing, it wasn't an indiscriminate killing. It was killing people who were resisting his regime. That's what dictators do. Uh, so the question is, well, should we go help this group? And, and I don't have any fault with that because I think Dick, you have a right to overthrow a tyrannical regime. But that right belongs to the citizens of that country, that, that they decide what, when you're going to cross this border of, into a revolution. Because as Bruce was saying earlier in his talk, revolution's a dangerous game. I mean, you, you kill a lot of people, uh, and you lose a lot of people, and so you got to think really long and hard before you take up arms against your own government. But that should be a decision of the people in that country, the Iraqi people. There's this mathematical calculation that takes place in this process that I think is so repugnant and so abhorrent. I don't know how many people they killed in Iraq. The, the numbers vary from 70, 80,000 to hundreds of thousands. And what the proponents of this say 
is that that's worth it. You see, that, that, that killing this number of people was worth establishing a democratic regime. I am so shocked at that kind of calculation. I, I mean, for a nation that prides itself on being Christians and the sanctity of human life and the life of the unborn and stuff, what they're saying is, is that sacrificing this group of people here is worth achieving a political goal of democracy over here. I don't see where God gives anybody the authority to do that, where you can sacrifice the lives of innocent people, people that say, well, we, we are, we're willing to live under tyranny. We will support our families. It's miserable. But to go in there and say, we, a foreign power, will make this decision for you, and we are, we're going to make this calculation of sacrificing, killing innocent people to bring you this democratic goal, I think flies in the face of every Christian uh, principle and principle of morality. Look at Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe suffered under the domination of the Soviet uh, empire. Brutal tyranny. I mean, no, I mean, the whole Cold War was fought because of the brutality of the Soviet Union, even though it was the U.S. government that turned over Eastern Europe to Stalin in the first place. We didn't make the calculation of going in there and, and invading and saving them from tyranny. It was horrible that they had to suffer under tyranny for 50 years or so. But we didn't make that, that calculation of this going in and bomb them. We didn't have that right. Those people were suffering under tyranny. Yeah, horrible. We should have opened up our borders to anybody that escaped, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and so forth. But to go in there and start dropping bombs and killing a certain percentage of the population in order to save them, absolutely not. I don't think that God has, has given anybody that authority to kill innocent people for the sake of a political goal. Yeah. Um, does the American government um, specifically ha have the right to use military force to protect American lives and American property overseas? Specifically, I'm referring to Jefferson's action, actions during the Tripoli War and the Quasi Wars. Okay. I would say absolutely not. Any more than any government has the, uh, the any foreign government has the right to come into the United States and defend the, the, the what it considers are the rights of its citizens. Um, I mean, right now, there, there's an accused terrorist named Jose Posada Carriles that the U.S. government is harboring. He is accused of downing um, a Cuban airliner, a civilian airliner containing the, the, a bunch of people, 80, 90 people, uh, including the um, members of Cuba's fencing team, young people. And he's accused of downing them over Venezuelan skies. And Venezuela, which has an extradition treaty with the United States, has demanded his extradition and uh, the U.S. refuses. How many Americans would defend the right of Venezuela to invade the United States and would fight on Venezuela's side in order to bring this terrorist back, accused terrorist back to justice? Right now, uh, I mentioned Chile. The Chilean government several weeks ago, I said that 9-11-73 that was a watershed period for Americans. The, the Chilean government is seeking the extradition of a U.S. military official for conspiracy to murder, to execute an American citizen during that coup named Charles Horman, 31-year-old guy, that it looks like the CIA and the U.S. military conspired to murder as part of this coup because he was a, a progressive, a liberal, a socialist. And, uh, and he, he also seems to have acquired information of the U.S. involvement in the coup. And there's a uh, uh, document uh, from the State Department showing that the CIA did participate in his murder. Does, does, uh, does Chile have the right to invade the United States and come in here to capture this guy? I say no. I think my position is that when an American goes overseas, you take your chances. You go into foreign countries, you go into Burma, and you push drugs there and you get caught, don't bellyache. Uh, and, and, and you also take the chance of being wrongfully convicted or wrongfully accused. It's, it's not a safe thing to go overseas. A little bit safer to go into Europe, you know, Italy, France, you start going into other countries, autocratic, totalitarian countries, go travel through Iraq. You, you get caught in Iraq, I say, you took your chances. You can't expect the U.S. government to come bail you out. Now, they may go and have you know, consular visits and try to make sure you have rights and so forth, absolutely. But to send troops in, to come and bail you out, absolutely not. Or to open up markets for you, or when your business is nationalized, you open up a business in Chile, you take the chance of nationalization, or, or, or Iran, uh, 
Um, that, that's one of the motivating factors in the Mossadegh uh, ouster, was uh, Mossadegh had nationalized British oil interests. That's why the CIA went in there and ousted him. No, I say you take the chances. If you don't want to take those chances, you want to play it safe, you stay right here at home. Questions? Yes, uh, given the um, 2012 uh, National Defense Authorization Act, um, do you think that there is uh, any type of uh, scenario um, and, and in what type of time frame do you think that uh, this may be used more frequently and in what context um, actually here in this country? Okay, what, what the NDAA did it was really it just codified what Bush had decreed on 9-11. I mean, Bush says, I'm a commander-in-chief, we're at war, which was ridiculous because terrorism's a criminal offense. It's like, it's like, we're in war on drugs, so now I'm a commander-in-chief because we're at war. And so every drug user and drug dealer, I'm gonna, I have a right to pick up. I don't need to charge him with any offenses. I can torture him. I can execute him. I can assassinate him. And so these powers already existed. This is what the Jose Padilla case was about, the power to pick up an American, take him to a military dungeon, torture him, keep him there forever without a trial. So the NDAA just was codifying what, what already existed. Now, at one point, does, does, do we worry about the 40,000 being rounded up? They're obviously not exercising this power right now, which is why everybody's just, you know, everything's cool, man, everything's calm, and Obama's only going to do it to guilty people. Well, when do they exercise these powers? Now, now, keep in mind, this is not a measure of a free society. And, and if I can impress on any, anything today that you remember, this is it. A free society is not measured by the extent to which these powers are, are exercised. A free society exists, is measured by the extent to which these powers are, exist. If you look in the Constitution, there is no power to assassinate. Americans are foreigners. There is no power to, to indefinitely detain people, to, to uh, torture people. And in fact, you got four amendments, four, five, four, fifth, sixth, and eighth, all directed to stopping the president and the government from doing these kind of things. So when would it happen? In a crisis. That's what we have to worry about, is some great big crisis, because the crises are when they do these things. 9-11, right? Man, okay, big crisis, everybody's scared, people's legs are shivering and stuff. And Oh, yeah, take away our freedoms, do anything to keep us safe from the terrorists. They're coming into my house, they're going to kidnap me, they're going to take me away. All these irrational fears. Chile, economic crisis. So you've got a terrorist crisis where the, the government has uh, you know, gotten all these powers. You've got an economic crisis. That's when Roosevelt exercised his dictatorial powers, nationalizing gold. That's what we've got to worry about is a big crisis. A dirty nuclear bomb goes off in some nuclear, in, in some city. Or there's an economic catastrophe where everybody's wiped out, you know, like sort of the Great Depression type thing. And people are jumping out of buildings because their fortunes have been lost and all of a sudden martial law is declared. And make no mistake about it, this is a loyal military. This is a loyal CIA. It will obey the orders of the president, especially in a crisis. The president says we need to maintain order and stability. The same thing that, the, that Mubarak was doing in Egypt, the same thing that Pinochet was doing. This is a military that believes in order and stability. This is a CIA that believes in these things. That's what we've got to worry about is the crisis. Because when the crisis comes, no one is safe, and, and including libertarians. Because they go after the dissidents. They go after the critics in these crises because they're perceived as enemies, as fifth columnists, as, as you know, people demoralizing the troops, fomenting revolution, and so forth. That's why we've got to work now. You know, during this period of time where there's, there's a sense of rationality, it's post 9-11, it's 12 years after the crisis environment, nobody was thinking after 9-11. I mean, we were saying these things after 9-11, and you would, I've never seen so much hate mail in my entire life. I mean, we had donation cancellations, we had subscription cancellations, we had emails flooding in about how we were unpatriotic, how we hate America, all this nonsense. Today, that doesn't exist. We're in a period of rationality, of conferences, debates, discussions, op-eds, letters to the editor. This is the time where we need to be working, and this is why I'm here today. This is where we need to be working, because we've got to get these powers dismantled. We've got to raise people's vision right now because once the crisis comes, and I'm talking about a big crisis, not some small crisis where, you know, Social Security's bankrupt or something like that. I'm talking about a big crisis.
because that's when they exercise these powers. Yes, sir. Most likely large-scale crisis would be mostly probably economic or? Could be either one uh, and both at the same time, which would be the perfect storm because they're, the fact that they're still killing people in Afghanistan, the rage is still there. And now they got sanctions that are, that are killing people in Iran. You know, they got planes dropping out of the sky because they can't get the repair parts. And you've got, I mean, imagine losing your whole life savings. So you've got anger rising up within Iranians, and, and then you've got um, still killing people in Afghanistan for at least two more years. You've got the economy in a nosedive here with the out-of-control spending, and in large part on the military. And my, I think the, the worst thing that could ever happen to this movement is a perfect storm where you've got a huge economic crisis where the government's talking about seizing gold again, nationalizing gold, make it a felony offense again to own gold, where they're seizing 401ks to, 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 to finance government operations, and all of a sudden a huge terrorist attack, attack on, on American soil. That's when you're going to see 9-11 environment, Pinochet 9-11, America 9-11. You're going to see that environment big time. And, and that's the thing that concerns me most because Obama's not going to start rounding up Americans like, you know, look, World War II rounded up, what, 120,000 Japanese Americans? The Supreme Court upholds it. Nobody squeals about it. Or a few people did. A few people opposed it. But that's what they get away with in a, in a big war or big crisis. They're provoking China right now. They, they need official enemies. They're getting out of Afghanistan. But they know that there's people like us that are questioning the whole apparatus of the national security state, the standing army, the foreign bases. They know we're out here. And they need official enemies. They need to keep people afraid that, oh, you know, the Soviet military threat or China military threat. And, and they, so the risk is they go out and provoke these enemies. And, and they're provoking China right now. That's the risk. What do you think is driving the record gun sales? Do you think that it's, do you think it's, it's fears that there's going to be an assault weapons ban in the future? Or is it because people are preparing for something extremely catastrophic? I think it's all of the above. Um, I mean, it's so ironic that, that Obama has made millionaires out of all these gun dealers. And, and, and I remember in the first four years of, it, of his administration, and gun sales were soaring. And, and the statists were saying, oh, they're all paranoid. You guys are paranoid. Obama's not doing anything. Ob look, Obama's not trying to seize guns. You guys are paranoid. And well, the gun sales kept going up and up and up. And <laughs> now the statists are eating crow because those people weren't paranoid. They were smart. Because now you go out and try to buy an AR-15 or a high-capacity magazine, you pay through the gazoo. I mean, like uh, I, I saw the price of a, um, a high-capacity magazine for a saw rifle a friend of mine bought for $20 that's now selling for $80. And I think people, uh, they're doing it out of self-protection. Uh, that for one thing, out of principle, right? because they believe it's, it's right to, to, for people to own guns. But I think it's the unknown factor. They don't know what's coming. And, and, and so there, there's the, the ability to resist tyranny. That was the whole idea behind the Second Amendment. Because if they start doing what Pinochet was doing, rounding up your girlfriends, rounding up your mothers, your fathers, your brothers, your cousins, your friends, and start raping them and killing them, which the Pentagon and the CIA was supporting in Chile, and they supported in, 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 F, in, in Egypt and in Guatemala and elsewhere. Well, at least Americans have an option. And I think, and I think Americans buy guns to keep the option open. That, okay, well, w w heaven forbid that should ever happen. And I don't think it will happen because, because everybody's armed. I mean, you know, er that's our best insurance policy. And, and so the worst thing we can ever do is to come to the gun control deals or where we disarm because then the, ty the would-be tyrants say, ah, now there's nothing I need to worry about. I mean, that was, again, why they didn't invade Switzerland because the Swiss were well-armed and they would fight. Um, so I think, I think it's that. I mean, that's our best protection. All these people buying guns is the greatest thing you ever had. And, and also, you know, a lot of people don't talk about this, but the, the, the possibility of invasion of a foreign power. Now, granted, that is a non-existent possibility. I mean, China you know, it can't even cross, you know, its own little oceans around there. And so it's ridiculous. But it's a nice deterrent that if any would-be power really ever got strong, that you got well-armed Americans out here that, man, it'd be like swallowing a porcupine. And that's why, that's why Hitler didn't, didn't invade Switzerland. Everybody was armed. 
And so that's the best protection we have. So I think it's it, why people do this, I think it's all of the above, all the reasons. Social chaos. You know, if there's a, if there's a, a big crisis economically, who knows if people are starving to death, what they'll do uh, coming out of the cities and marauding and so forth. I think people are buying guns as an insurance policy, knowing that when you buy auto insurance or fire insurance, the probability is you'll never have to do it. Um, but it's valuable to have. I think that's what's going on. Thank you, Mr. Hornberger. Hey, thanks, you guys. Uh, Please give another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.